can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you first got involved in climate activism? Sure. Um, so uh, I started out as an architect, so 25 years as an architect, working a lot in public sector and in schools. And I did my first green school in, was completed in 2003. And I think it was more like a gradual evolution into climate activism rather than one day I woke up and I decided I was just going to you know, do this. Um, so I started getting into green schools. Again, that was like 20 years ago when uh, green schools and you know, green buildings, quite frankly, just first came out. So um, once I completed my first uh, green school for Oakland Unified, I was both hooked and ruined. Hooked because I couldn't go back and do a non-green school, right, with, you know, great energy performance and, right, energy efficiency, water efficiency, and non-toxic materials, all of that. But moreover, I was ruined because I literally could not, you know, do anything but. I could not force myself to do anything that was more conventional. So basically, I... Uh, left the firm that I was in where I was a principal and started my own green building and sustainability consulting firm. So from there, um, I decided that, you know, I really wanted to dedicate my professional life to creating as much real world greenhouse gas reductions as possible. And as it got closer and closer to the latest IPCC reports on climate change and the the degree of urgency really since the fourth assessment in 2015 and knowing that the target was to remain below 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2030, <clears throat> that made me you know, sort of move into panic mode. So basically the next sort of critical thing that happened maybe was I signed up to do the climate reality training in 2018. And I know you just went through the training and um, as one of my mentees. so. Very proud of that. And I, I think that that jump started me into getting more into an activist role. So I've been speaking more and um, you know, writing more letters and getting more active into trying to create real world gas, greenhouse gas reductions at pace and scale. So um, that brings us up to where we are now. So I, I'm trying to see if I can do that in school districts. That's great. Can you tell us a little bit more about that zero carbon school district initiative that you're working on and kind of what the ultimate goal is there? Yeah, good question. And thanks for asking. Um, so over the last year and a half, um, almost two years, um, I've had this notion that, you know, tied to what, what started me off in climate activism is one good green school, no matter how zero net energy or even zero carbon, one school or one building at a time is way too slow uh, for the amount of climate change we need, um, the amount of action we need, right, in the time frame. So I decided to scale up and think, what if we did all school, a whole district at a time? So I spent the previous maybe eight years or so working on one school district. And even that was too slow. Um, so I decided to scale up again and think about what could be a program design that would allow all 1,000 school districts in the state of California to become zero carbon school districts. And so since then, um, the initiative has developed into trying to create um, a program and uh, reach out and create toolkits and tools. and. Right now, we're at the point where we need to engage all the rest of the school district uh, stakeholders. So not only the school districts themselves, of course, you, the students and the teachers, but also all of the building industry, design professionals, engineers, and contractors, as well as the state agencies, right, that govern the school facilities and also provide funding. So it's trying to get us all together to create a plan, a statewide strategic plan to create a program where we can scale this thing. Say we have a, a thousand school districts. Could you do, you know, a, a hundred school districts each year for the next 10 years, right? 
in order to reach that zero carbon goal by 2030. So um, we're just at the beginning part where we're reaching out to other partners and to other folks to start to engage them to really do a needs assessment and find out what they need. What are the tools they need? Obviously, funding's one, you know, and um, you know, technical assistance, right? Knowledge-based workforce training, all those kinds of things have to come together to actually implement a program and roll it out. But it's exciting, and um, and I'm really excited to work hopefully with Las Gatas. Maybe we can talk about that a little bit at the end. That'll be super exciting. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the main benefits of the zero carbon emissions for a school district? Yes. Um, well, there are many, but they fall into maybe four main categories. So the first one is um, with the energy savings comes operational cost savings. So eventually, um, right now your utility bills and your energy use in, the, in your campuses are reflected in sort of two pots of money, one for electricity and one for natural gas. Most of your space heating and water heating and cooking is in the natural gas category. And uh, lighting and plug loads, your electronics, your computers and technology and so forth. That's what makes up the, the bulk of the electricity use. When we, when we take the electricity and we source it from renewable energy, that footprint can go to zero when it's zero carbon free energy. When we, when we do that, what is left is your greenhouse gas footprint is all of your natural gas based use. So what we need to do is not only put on renewables and drive down this energy use, we also need to transform this use um, in natural gas based carbon based energy into new electricity um, based heat pump technology. And that's the big challenge in all of the, the 90% of our buildings are already existing. That's gonna be the challenge. We call that decarbonization, where we actually um, switch out old gas appliances when they're failing and when they need replacement with the new heat pump, all electric heat pump technology. Once we can do all of that, then we transfer that energy into what can be supplied by 100% clean energy. And then that's how we zero out the carbon emissions. So in doing that, we can zero out carbon emissions as a benefit, which is obviously the goal for climate change action. We zero out your um, energy bills totally. So for example, if your school district spends $6 million a year on utilities, that $6 million could go into educational program for teachers and um, right, your, your school programming. The other main benefit is um, in, in the opportunity to actually engage teachers and students in the process itself of learning about energy and climate. And it's in its very connections that we're talking about here and what you may have learned a little bit about in the climate reality training. So it's a great opportunity to, to really graduate eco-literate citizens out of our K-12 system and teach everyone about the connection between energy use in our built environment and its effect, right, um, in its climate change impacts because of its greenhouse gas emissions. So there's a great educational opportunity. And then the last one is, uh, fourth one is really providing community resilience. So when we, when we provide all of the energy that you need uh, by renewables, on-site renewables, solar or wind on your campuses, and we have battery storage with smart controls, what that gives you is essentially the starts of a um, microgrid so that you're, you're fairly uh, energy independent from grid outages, so either power outages, or as we've um, experienced now that the wildfires are going through in California, the PSPS events, public, public safety power shutoff, events, PSPS, um, and it gives you the ability to also um, uh, create a resilience hub, if you will, for the community, not only for the school, but also for the surrounding neighborhood community to come to as an emergency shelter, because we could then have power that's provided 
at that school site, people could come and you know, plug in their um, cell phones to get their communications and keep their essentials going. The other advantage of transferring uh, to heat pump technology from gas furnaces and dirty gas boilers and so on for heating systems is that it's a, um, it's a heat transfer system whereby a reversing switch on the, on the uh, mechanism actually can actually do the reverse. Instead of just providing heating, it also can provide cooling. So now with our heat wave events, which we're, you know, we're in one right now, and with more wildfire events where people need clean filtered air and cooling, that can also be provided with heat pump technology. So there's lots of resilience benefits that the community gains, not just the school, um, if you can create the microgrid out of your zero carbon schools. Yeah, there are some clearly really important benefits there. Um, as you mentioned before, the students here at Los Gatos have started a petition to support the district participating in your initiative. If the district is interested in participating in the Zero Carbon School District's research project, and we hope that the administration and the director of facilities are, what would that mean for our campus? Oh my gosh. Um, well, it would mean that you could open the door to gaining all of those four broad categories of benefits um, at your school district. Um, so uh, hopefully immediately, you know, the educational part, you know, we could start off with that because you could learn how to actually take your greenhouse gas inventory and, right, define your carbon footprint. I just think it would be so exciting because you would start to you know, gain that educational opportunity, gain some of the operational expense um, reductions, um, and reduce your carbon, which is what it's all about, right? Yeah, totally. And for people out there who really want to get involved in climate activism, they don't quite know where to start, what would you recommend to them? I would say the number one thing is you do not have to do it alone. There are lots of organizations around um, that you can go to join. And once you get in with a group, um, you'll find that there's lots of resources and people just coming out of the woodworks to help you and, and uh, get you engaged. I'd say the number one uh, organization would be climaterealityproject.org um, to go to on the adult side. And um, there's another growing uh, organization called Climate Parents with the Sierra Club that will help uh, parents of your school communities. For school-aged folks, young youth activists, there are so many, right, great uh, climate activist organizations. So there's Youth Versus Apocalypse, Fridays for Future, the new Zero Hour created by one of our own climate reality leaders. Um, and even 350.org. So you can all um, go to your local organizations and use your fingers on the internet and uh, find partners, find support. Great, thank you so much for that. We really appreciate you coming and sharing with us today. Thanks so much, Rochelle, appreciate it.